water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nay any drop to drink. Hello, is the world really running out of water? This question rolls off Nancy's lips. After the tap she turned on in order to take a bath, responded with this subterranean burble. And then three drops. And then silence. Has day zero finally come? Water is classified as a renewable resource alongside other renewable resources in our world such as air, biomass, geothermal energy, solar energy and human and animal power. All renewable resources are so described because they can replenish themselves by natural means. The sun keeps shining, plants and animals keep growing and reproducing, the wind still keeps on blowing and rivers keep on flowing. There are three types of water, blue water i.e. water from surface and groundwater reservoirs such as lakes, rivers and aquifers, green water i.e. rainwater which is stored in the soil and transpired by plants, and grey or black water i.e. wastewater or polluted water. Of all the renewable resources, water is the largest. Still, water has just stopped running in Nancy's home. And so she asks, and so you ask, is the world running out of water? The world is indeed running out of water. According to research, at least 1.2 billion people around the world are suffering from a shortage of water and its adverse consequences on health, food and energy. No, that cannot be, you're saying. Look at all the vast seas, to say nothing of the rivers and streams and lakes and glaciers. How could the world be running out of water? How could the world be running out of water? Well. That's why Coleridge's Mariner lamented in the first place. Water covers just over 70% of the Earth's surface. Sea water makes up about 97% of all that water. Fresh water, from which comes the water that supports life on Earth, makes up the remaining 3%. Some of that 3% is in the soil, in the air as water vapour, and in glaciers and ice caps, leaving us humans with just 0.3% of the fresh water, which we find in surface water and groundwater. Water. In addition, not all water is renewable per se. Fossil waters in particular are non-renewable. These are deep-lying underground water reserves or aquifers which first fell as rain or flowed from melting snow in a different geological period, say tens to hundreds of thousands of years ago, when mastodons stomped about on Earth. These fossil water reserves include the Nubian water aquifer, the Ogallala aquifer and the Sak aquifer among others. These waters percolated deep into the Earth's crust and became sealed off by rock formations. Around the mid-20th century, fossil waters were discovered for the first time. Since then, many countries have been using fossil waters to grow crops and transform swaths of dry land into scenes of lush farmland on which are cultivated some of the world's staples such as rice and wheat. With the discovery of fossil groundwater, food became abundant and affordable and inevitably, human population grew with the abundance. But the fossil waters are running out and the prognosis does not look good. Just as they took thousands of years to be formed, the aquifers holding fossil groundwater will take thousands of years to be replenished once depleted. The world's staples could well become scarce and expensive and competition for food and water will arise among human populations, which of course continue to grow in a planet that continues to warm up. The countries that could be the most affected by this prognosis include India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and a number of its neighbouring countries, and the United States of America. As the groundwater footprints in these countries, i.e. the areas surround and directly served by the groundwater, is significantly larger than the actual aquifers located in those areas. The total number of people who will be immediately affected by the depletion of fossil groundwater stands at about 1.7 billion, or one out of every five people in the world. And that one could be you or your sister, brother, father, mother, relative or friend, surely a fellow human. Renewable water sources such as rainwater, surface reservoirs and younger groundwater replenished by way of the water cycle are vulnerable to overexploitation too. All over the world, these surface water bodies have been shrinking over many years due to human activities, fueling competition, conflict and the forced displacement of human populations. We are using water faster than nature is renewing it. 
If there's such a thing as the golden rule guiding the use of renewable resources, then it must be what the German physicist Armin Grünwald recorded in the third chapter of the book Geoethics, Ethical Challenges and Case Studies in Earth Sciences, thus. The usage rate of renewable resources must neither exceed their replenishment rate nor endanger the efficiency and reliability of the respective ecosystem. On the one hand, it is essential that resources are extracted in a gentle way to protect the inventory. Humans shall not consume more than can be replenished. On the other hand, it has to be ensured that the respective ecosystems are not overstrained, e.g by emissions or serious imbalances. On the one hand, the local usage rate must not be too high. On the other hand, no ecologically problematic technologies may be applied for the usage. Factors such as land use, water withdrawals, pollution, eutrophication, climate change, all driven by population growth and urbanization, economic development and globalization, and changes in dietary and water consumption patterns have negatively affected universal compliance to this humane principle of responsible, sustainable use. Some of these factors, such as economic development, urbanization and globalization, are not bad things per se, but the trouble is that they could result in considerable strain on resources available for human and animal use and on the pre-existing systems set up to distribute them. Water is the most widely used of all renewable resources. How do we stop our blue planet from running out of water? Scientists are deploying satellite-based tools such as remote sensing and geographic information system to monitor changes in the volume of groundwater and to calculate groundwater footprint in addition to the already established use of a variety of traditional tools and methods. Concerned mathematicians are tackling the problem using numerical modeling as well. Groundwater footprinting is essential to help us have an idea of whether groundwater is being replenished at the same rate as it is being used. According to a study published in Nature in 2012, groundwater footprinting methods have revealed that the global groundwater footprint encompasses about 131.8 billion square kilometers, which is roughly three and a half times the total area of the world's active aquifers. About 80% of these active aquifers are larger than their groundwater footprints, i.e. the areas that they serve. This means that the remaining 20% are smaller than their groundwater footprints. This in turn means that the 20% are heavily overexploited. Talk about the Pareto Principle. Agriculture relies heavily on water. In 2020, agriculture consumed at least 70% on average of all the water taken from freshwater sources, according to the World Bank. That is 70% of the 0.3% of usable water. Agricultural practices have begun to change in some parts of the world in order to conserve water resources and adapt to climate change. Innovation in irrigation technology has brought about water-saving technologies such as the center pivot irrigation system invented by an American farmer, Frank Zybach, in 1948, and the drip irrigation system invented by the Polish-Israeli engineer Simcha Blas in 1959. Plant biotechnology advances are leading to the development of drought-resistant crops, which will grow and produce yield in spite of little rainfall. The drawbacks here include the fairly long time the researchers take, the amount of investment they require, and the obligation of buying new seeds every planting season, because some of the seeds do lose their drought-resistant traits over time. The benefit of high yields, even without adequate rainfall, appears to diminish these snags, though. And speaking of inventions and innovations, some companies are using inventive ways to get water to human populations. Walkout Water is a system invented to trap water from rain, fog and even dew, mimicking nature. There are various other similar systems with varying degrees of efficiency. Solar-powered water pumps also help to distribute water in vulnerable areas using solar energy. And what about the water, water everywhere cry? The ancient mariners lament about useless seawater. Rich countries, especially those in the Middle East, are increasingly turning to desalination. This is the process of removing mineral salts and other impurities from seawater in order to have usable fresh water as the end product. 
Traditional desalination involves getting fresh water from salt water by boiling and distillation. An alternative desalination process involves the use of reverse osmosis, passing the water through a semi-permeable membrane that allows fresh water through it while restricting the passage of salt and minerals. Advancements such as the use of graphene and the process of electrodialysis have been proposed to combat the fouling of the membrane by the salt and other particulate matter in the seawater. Still, whether by boiling or reverse osmosis, desalination is an expensive process, affordable only to rich countries and one over which still hangs this cloud. What do we do with all the brine that's left over without hurting life? Some researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology seem to have found the answer to that question. The desalination waste could be converted into useful chemicals such as sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, both of which are raw materials used at some stage or other in the desalination process. Let's call that brine cycling here. By 2030, we all will be checking whether we have achieved the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the sixth of them, which is to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all, is one of the most closely related to this video. As many as 129 countries, or nearly 7 out of every 10 countries are, at the moment, not on track to have sustainably managed water resources by 2030, the current rate of progress needs to double. Nancy says, and you're saying, Oh dear, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a policymaker, I'm not an expert. What can I, as an ordinary person, do to stop the world from running out of water? Good question. Since we cannot hasten nature's processes of replenishing our water, the thing we can control is our water use. We must learn to use water responsibly. There is a variety of affordable ways to do so, to conserve water, with just a little effort. Send the cursor flying to the top of your screen towards the end of this video, and there you'll find a short series of videos on how to conserve water. Nature abhors waste. As Benjamin Franklin said, when the well is dry, we know the worth of water. According to a proverb from the Yoruba people of southwestern Nigeria, we do not wait until we are thirsty before we fetch water. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. So long.